Hello and welcome, friends. I welcome you to another series of Usana's dialogues. Uh, and on the behalf of Usana's foundation, I would like to give a very warm welcome to all the guests here. Today, we are joined by a very eminent personality and a very interesting author, Ambassador Ajay Bisari. Before I move on to the real interview, I would like to give a brief interview for uh, the bio of uh, Mr. Ajay, Ambassador Ajay Bisaria. First of all, congratulations, Ambassador Bisaria, for your amazing book, Anger Management, Troubled Diplomatic Relationship Between India and Pakistan. This is his book. Thank you, Abhinav. Thank you uh, for having me. Great to be here. I was regretting missing out uh, on uh, joining you in Udaipur, but uh, this is the next best thing to do it virtually. Well, if it would have been absolutely great if you had joined us here at the Maharana Pratap dialogue, but no worries, next time. And uh, I must say that the book, but the name, you know, the anger management, the first impression which anyone gets is that it's some kind of a management classic, you know, written by you know, like real expert management gurus, but then it turns out to be something entirely different. Well, I'll come back to that later about the title and the contents of the book. But before that, I would just like to read your bio. So, Ambassador Ajay Bisaria is a commentator on international affairs and a distinguished fellow at Observer Research Foundation. He joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1987 and in a career spanning 35 years, dealt with some of India's key economic and security relationships. Mm -hmm. He served as Indian High Commissioner to Pakistan from 2017 to 2020. He has been Indian High Commissioner to Canada and India's Ambassador to Poland and Lithuania. He has also represented the country at the World Bank in Washington, D.C. and in embassies at Berlin and Moscow. He has served in various capacities in the Ministry of External Affairs, Department of Commerce and Prime Minister's Office, where he was a key aide to the Prime Minister, uh, key aide to Prime Minister Vajpayee from 1999 to 2004. He has a bachelor's degree in economics from St. Stephen's College, Delhi University, an MBA from IIM Calcutta, and a master's degree in public policy from Princeton University. So now I have an added responsibility, but uh, because you are also my senior, I also went to St. Stephen's College. So, oh, wonderful. Same. That's great to know. Thank you. And so today we are discussing a very, very critical and an important issue. India-Pakistan relationship, uh, which has dominated the geostrategic uh, discourse in this entire subcontinent, also beyond for the last uh, six to seven decades. And uh, what we are going to discuss today is a book which is written by an eminent diplomat, but it is also a history. So here it's an interesting take. A diplomat is donning a historian's cap and also analyzing things uh, for uh, over the last, uh, which happened over the last six to seven decades. This is something which is always missed. We have seen experts, academic experts, journalists writing uh, 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 writing a lot about India-Pakistan relationship, terrorism, but a diplomat state was missing, uh, uh, and that too in such a holistic manner. So before I come back to the interview, I would also like to introduce uh, uh, today's interview, Arjuna Guhare. She will be starting the interview, and uh, let me introduce her briefly. Dr. Anjana Guha Roy is an independent researcher based in New Delhi. Her interests pertain to geopolitics and international relations. Anjana completed her PhD in international relations from the University of Delhi. She worked with prominent think tanks like ICRA and Delhi Policy Group in the recent past. She will be interviewing you for the first part. After that, I'll just bother you with some of my questions. And uh, Anjana, this is the interview. Uh, so we are going to do it for about 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, you begin with the interview. And then uh, once you're done with your questions, please uh, give it to me. Thank you. Over to you, Anjana. Uh, okay. uh, thanks, Abhinav. Um, and uh, thanks for the thanks for the opportunity to uh, let uh, me ask my you know questions, few questions to Mr. Ajay Bisaria. And thank you. Sir. I mean, I've gone through your book and it's uh, wonderful. And I, I mean, at times it has been like there are a lot of anecdotes to it, and there is a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, insights and reflexes to your, uh, to your experience. So I would uh, just love to take this to use this opportunity to ask, uh, you know, first that so uh, while you were there, I mean, serving in Pakistan, uh, what you think uh, like what was your experience about you know the common people how how they think about india how they react about india how they talk about india um, so that uh, if you just can share about your 
interpersonal experience about uh, you know your like you know your observation about that thank you sir over to you yes uh, thanks anjana and before that let me uh, just you know comment on something that abhinav said uh, in in my view i see this book as a practitioner's account so it is an account a practitioner's account perhaps of the history uh, putting in a lens to the history of the diplomatic practitioners uh, not just my own uh, period of time but also those of my predecessors and my successors in in pakistan so that is the uh, unique lens that i i have tried to bring with this book to a subject which has been much uh, written about and discussed and very rightly it's one of india's most uh, critical relationships uh, also because of the fact that we've had multiple conflicts between india and pakistan uh, but to your question how does pakistan view india how do pakistani uh, citizens view india i think uh, it, it, there are multiple levels at which uh, this uh, issue can be addressed and you know there are multiple constituencies from india's point of view in pakistan so india has multiple pakistan policies not just one but uh, when we talk about pakistan the army's view and the army establishment's view and uh, you know official pakistan's view is a little different uh, as compared to uh, have i lost you i'm just seeing something on my webex screen Uh, no, sir, no, sir. Fine, sir. Okay, okay. It was updating. I'm sorry. You'll have to edit that out. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, on on the question on how Pakistanis view India, there are multiple levels at which uh, you could, uh, you know, address that question. Uh, the Pakistan Army and the Pakistan establishment, uh, the uh, establishment which uh, includes official Pakistan, that has a different view. that is completely colored by an official narrative uh, that suits this establishment uh, which is in place but uh, you see alternative narratives among the people uh, you will see different geographical narratives if you get out of punjab and hear them in balochistan or in uh, sindh or in khyber pakhtunkhwa there would be a different take on india there would be a different take on india in uh, in uh, pakistan occupied kashmir but i think uh, also now what we are seeing is that at the popular level there is a very strong anti establishment mood in pakistan an anti army mood which has always been there to uh, a greater or lesser extent and the people uh, look at india very differently from the way the official pakistan does sometimes the poison of the official narrative seeps into the popular narrative but by and large uh, you will see a lot of uh, latent goodwill for india uh, and uh, often uh, this thing uh, this goodwill is visible now in social media uh, because if you see some of the podcasts and particularly those by younger pakistanis they are uh, willing to look at india with fresh eyes they are willing to benchmark themselves against india be critical of their own country and admire some of the things uh, that they see across so uh, i think it's a it's a mixed bag um in in my time uh, i could face a hostile conversation at the pakistan foreign office in the morning uh, a good conversation with uh, fellow diplomats in the afternoon and a very convivial and friendly conversation in the evening uh, with uh, with pakistani citizens who were not part of the government so uh, i i think um, uh, there is a strong uh, people to people connect and it is by and large positive uh thank you sir thank you for your uh, response uh, one uh, one event that is uh, extremely extremely prominent in our recent uh you know uh, in the memory of our recent past when it comes to india pakistan trajectory bilateral relations trajectory is pulwama so how uh, was you know please share your experiences your insights and how you were dealing with you know you know the the entire ecosystem uh when uh, this entire thing was happening so what was going on please share you know the pulwama terrorist uh, incident now in hindsight is one of the turning points 
uh, in in the India Pakistan relationship. Uh, if you recall, in 2018, when Imran Khan was uh, came to power, there were some positive uh, developments. There was a positive mood in terms of trying to engage with Pakistan and trying to assess how uh, the Pakistan led by Imran Khan would be different uh, from Pakistan in the past. But when on the 14th of February 2019, <clears throat> the Pulwama attack took place, I think that changed the complete equation. It, it uh, confirmed to India that nothing had changed. The Pakistan establishment was not willing to rein in terrorism. Uh, you know, the attack was owned by the Jaish e Mohammed. I was in Pakistan at that point, and initially it appeared to be a small incident with a few people unfortunately killed. But then, when it was clear that it was a massive uh, incident with uh, more than 40 uh, Jawans having been killed uh, in a terrorist explosion, I, it, it meant that uh, this would be, uh, India would react seriously, uh, particularly because India had reacted in 2016 uh, with surgical strikes to an attack in Uri. So it was clear that perhaps uh, India uh, uh, would react in a bigger way. So I was called in uh, for, by my government, by the government of India uh, to come in for consultations. And I spent a lot of time in uh, Delhi after Pulwama having those conversations uh, with uh, my colleagues with people in our security establishment and it was clear uh, that the political leadership was incensed and that the reaction uh, to this would be very strong um, even more uh, strong than we had seen three years earlier in the surgical strikes so what we got finally was the as a reaction to it was the air strikes in balakot um, just about 12 days later on the 26th of february uh, Pakistan was seeing it coming. Pakistan knew that India was was upset and India would not let this uh, event go unpunished. And uh, that is precisely happened. And after that, uh, what we saw was that uh, there was a, a episode of coercive diplomacy by India. India uh, used when an Indian pilot went down in uh, one of the exchanges after Balakot. Uh, India had uh, threatened and India was willing to escalate the issue. Fortunately, good sense prevailed on Pakistan. They returned the pilot and uh, we could contain for the moment the escalation that was caused uh, after the Pulwama attack. Thank you, sir. So uh, I'm just very curious that if uh, diplomacy has its limit, what else can steer ahead the boat of shared concerns of both countries? And uh, I mean, uh, in the broader picture, the, the, the troubled relationship and also how far political leadership plays a role on both sides in determining strategic discourse of this bilateral relations. So over to you. You know, you raise a very important question. And uh, if if I look at the sweep of the 76 years of the relationship. Uh, and if you see the last chapter in my book, I, I make the point that uh, there are several structural factors determining the adverse uh, relationship, the hostility between the countries, and they relate to security, they relate to uh, the, the Pakistan's quest for an identity for itself, and Pakistan's uh, quest for territory. But uh, Beyond this and the global forces that come into play, there is also human agency involved. And that's where uh, leadership matters and diplomacy matters. So even in a hostile relationship, as the India-Pakistan relationship demonstrates, uh, the leadership and, uh, and diplomacy plays a role. There is a space for both. And arguably, with good leadership and smart diplomacy, you can steer the relationship to a better space. And I think this is particularly required in uh, Pakistan, where uh, leadership has been lacking uh, because of the complete uh, dominance of the army, which tends to look at the relationship from a security prism. So uh, certainly, uh, you know, diplomacy has its limits. Uh, the leadership has to often deploy 
hard power uh, and uh, this is something uh, that has to be done uh, you know in in case uh, on the other side uh, the belligerence exceeds a certain level okay before i hand over uh, the mic to uh, abhinav i have just one question uh, to you, sir quoting from your book that uh, has the snakes outweighed the ladders in the snakes and ladder game of India's engagement with Pakistan? You know, I, I think it's a great question. Um, certainly to this point, it does appear uh, that the snakes are winning. And, um, uh, you know, what, what that metaphor alludes to is the cyclicality of the relationship, but also of the unforeseen factors that can suddenly improve the relationship and worsen it. So I think every terrorist incident is a snake, uh, which sets us back. Uh, but uh, I, I would say there is also hope because I think a ladder is when you have uh, new governments in both countries and uh, you have a certain relative decline in terrorism and therefore uh, ability and willingness to take a fresh look at the relationship I think that would be a ladder. So hopefully, so far, uh, the snakes have uh, have you know outnumbered the ladders, but perhaps we have a ladder that we are seeing right now. Uh, thank you for all the answers, sir. Uh, so now I hand over uh, the mic to Anna. And so much look forward to the second part of the conversation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Amma. So I have about five to six questions. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, Ambassador Basaria. I have about five to six questions, so I'll be starting with them. Anger management, very interesting title. So that, do you think that diplomats are mostly managing the anger, or they have a role in deciding the longer-term vision and the larger trajectory of India's foreign policy with Pakistan? Added to this, I would like to know. What role or, or to what extent politicians have played a major role in India's you know, foreign policy discourses with Pakistan and also on the Pakistani side? We know that army is the main driver, but then what what is the role of the extremist actors, the extremist organizations? So uh, I would just like to know uh, the role of the different actors. Yes, you know, so anger is a metaphor that I have uh, deployed in the title of the book to to refer to the passions that you know come about in this relationship historically because of partition because of the wars in contemporary times because of terrorism and and if there's some advocacy in the book it is that uh, both political actors and diplomatic actors need to uh, not be governed by short-term passions but by long-term interests and uh, we need to be playing the long game uh, in order to, uh, you know, take this relationship to a place where we can manage it uh, better. But uh, to your question about uh, politicians uh, and the army, you know, certainly uh, the reality of Pakistan, the structural reality, which has been a, a drag on this relationship is the fact that the army dominates the polity in Pakistan. The army dominates all decisions on foreign and security policy and therefore India policy. And therefore the paranoia, the identity crisis that, that the uh, army and the Pakistan state faced become determining factors in this relationship. In India, uh, yeah, all through this period, the decisions were taken. The, fine, the buck had stopped with the Indian prime minister, with the political class. So there was a certain asymmetry uh, or has been an asymmetry in India's political leadership and diplomatic uh, kind of leadership dealing with a Pakistan where the security establishment is taking the decisions. So obviously the, uh, the, there was an asymmetry and that is part of the problem. But India, I think over a period of time, uh, the political leadership has been smart enough to realize that we need to deal with Pakistan the way it is and the, not the way it should be. And therefore, uh, India has been willing to deal with the army when it was in the front office for 30 years or when it was running the show from the back office, um, you know, dealing uh, with the politicians it had propped up. Um, 
But uh, what I do advocate for a future strategy is to have a, uh, an, a channel of communication always with the army. And even if some decisions are taken by the front office folks, which means the civilians as currently, uh, we should be triangulating it, verifying uh, any, any uh, decisions with the uh, Pakistan army, because at the end of the day, that uh, institution is running the country. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, do you think that finally, uh, with this government, we have arrived at some degree of consistency and realism in both our foreign policy with Pakistan and also in our Kashmir policy? Like with Pakistan, we have made it explicitly clear that terror and talks cannot go together. As regarding Kashmir, uh, in 2019, uh, particularly uh, after 2014, I must say, with this NIA's you know, active uh, drive against terrorism, Government of India's active initiation against terrorism on multiple fronts like terror financing. And finally, with the approbation of Article 370, it seems that finally we have a roadmap for Kashmir at a political level. So do you agree with this? I, I do. In fact, uh, you know, you have written, uh, I have seen extensively on terror financing. And um, uh, what I think you conclude and uh, most observers conclude is that uh, India has changed the paradigm uh, of addressing terrorism. So one of the changes that, as far as Pakistan is concerned is that India does not anymore conflate its Pakistan policy and its Kashmir policy. A Pakistan policy of, uh, of uh, a tough uh, posture on terrorism is an external policy. A, a Jammu and Kashmir policy, which at the moment is of uh administering a healing touch and uh looking at development within pakistan within uh, jammu and kashmir is something which is an internal policy pakistan has no locus standi in india's internal conversations uh with its own people uh of uh, let's say uh, between uh the conversations that new delhi would have with any region uh, in the country is an internal conversation. And I think this conflation has gone because in the past, Pakistan wanted to promote the narrative that it is a stakeholder in uh, for the future of Jammu and Kashmir. So I think uh, that has ended and it is clear that the Jammu and Kashmir situation can uh, be, be improved domestically in, and normalized uh, once we get terrorism out of the equation and particularly cross-border terrorism and, and after that, uh, we create conditions for uh, development and healing uh, within the country. And, uh, and I think that is the direction in which we are moving uh, for the more than uh, a decade, but certainly in the last five years. So your book reads like an excellent history book. And I, I could see a historian coming out of you several times ago. As you also rightly said that it's a practitioner's account of history of India and Pakistan's relationship. But I have a question. So when a diplomat is writing about, you know, uh, the diploma, diplomats or the uh, predecessors, you know, who were actually running the show and who were deciding things, so to what extent the objectivity is hampered? So do you think that, uh, uh, I would say, a properly historian from the academic side should if they come and write uh, uh, accounts of such accounts of the diplomatic history between india and pakistan there would be more objectivity i mean it's just a personal question did you face that i mean there was the objectivity was hindered at any level well you know i think that would always be a challenge for any writer uh, to be objective and um, fortunately um, i was only uh, where i can be accused of bias or first person accounts is the two years that I was uh, uh, sort of dealing with the relationship, but the 70 years before me and the four years after, I have relied on accounts of others. And, uh, you know, and therefore, like any um, uh, historian, uh, I would need to be objective in uh, going through the accounts. What uh, I could, I did do, and with a very conscious bias, is use a lens. And, you know, uh, in history, you could argue that is a subaltern history when you use a particular lens to approach that history. And that was the lens of the uh, practitioners of the day, the practitioners of diplomacy. Uh, fortunately, I had uh, of my 24 predecessor uh, 
ambassadors and heads of mission before me, about half of them had written accounts or had spoken or talked about or their accounts are available in writing. So uh, you could equally tell the story by putting a lens, say, of the military operations or the intelligence operations and come up with an interesting account or uh, an account that takes into uh, factors in everything. But what I've tried to do is put the primary lens on the diplomacy, but also look at historians' accounts of the past and draw from them as well. So the story is not just of India-Pakistan diplomacy, but also of what was happening within India, what was happening within Pakistan, and what was happening globally that was impacting on this relationship. Thank you very much. Now let me explore the historian inside you a bit more. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, yes. Uh, a very fundamental question. What is the real cause of India-Pakistan rivalry? Imagine if we were to resolve all the boundary disputes, including Kashmir and everything, the terrorism and everything, can these two countries live in peace and flourish together? So I think that is a interesting and a very complex question, and uh, it is important not to oversimplify it. But if in my account, uh, if you see the first chapter, I have uh, centrally argued that there are three factors that have driven uh, this hostility or this relationship. And the primary one is Pakistan's own identity crisis. Uh, it is, it's a quest for identity in Pakistan, uh, a quest for territory and a quest for security. Now, all these are structural factors uh, that have determined uh, the shape of the relationship. And I would argue that uh, these structural factors are the primary factors. Now, uh, of course, uh, terrorism and the territorial issue of Jammu and Kashmir have uh, uh, played a role in, in particularly in recent times in determining the shape of the relationship. But uh, our, uh, from India's point of view, the primary problem is that Pakistan was never a normal country. So if you would have a normal neighbor defined as a country which uh, perhaps does not have the army determining every little bit of uh, policy in Pakistan and also uh, not using the instrument of terrorism as state policy, uh, we could have been in a better space and we could have a, had a better way of uh, even discussing the original uh, uh, territorial issue of Jammu and Kashmir uh, if we had an atmosphere free of uh, violence and terror. So I think that is a hypothetical, but uh, certainly I think there, is, there are more than one drivers of this hostility. So we shouldn't reduce it to a single point narrative that only because of the core issue of Jammu and Kashmir or only because of uh, one uh, issue of terrorism, we have multiple issues on the table and we need to address all of them. So, you know, just uh, something related to this, okay. Uh, I definitely agree that there are multiple issues, but do you think that there is something which is much deeper, I know, uh, you mentioned about that Pakistan's quest for identity. Something which is much deeper, which drives this conflict in essence. Yes, so I, I would argue that it is the uh, quest for identity. And um, I, we, you can even talk of things that it is not. It is not a religious conflict because uh, you see that two nation theory, which went out of the window in 1971 uh, after Bangladesh was created, you see it. Uh, being uh, demolished every day when India's relationships with Bangladesh, which is uh, equally a Muslim country, uh, has reached uh, a very high level of understanding in which we have $18 billion of trade and $8 billion of uh, Indian uh, lines of credit for Bangladesh. So uh, it is certainly not a fundamental uh, religious conflict in any sense. And I think uh, India would have found a modus vivendi to deal with this neighbor um, had this been a normal neighbor. And I think uh, the fundamental uh, cause of the abnormality, I think, is uh, the identity crisis. Now, uh, we could 
make that argument in different frames and come up with more basic issues. But I, um, in my view, uh, it is a Pakistan's uh, identity issue, um, which is at the center of this problem, uh, which is uh, a question of, uh, you know, how the Pakistani state draws its own identity, uh, that it is incomplete without the territory of Jammu and Kashmir, that it is incomplete uh, without uh, uh, eliminating in some sense uh, the threat that comes from India. So one more thing. Uh, in your initial chapters, you have discussed a lot about the minorities, uh, minority issues, you know, which figured prominently in the diplomatic discussions and all the Hindu minority in Pakistan and the Muslim minority in India. With that comes the question of a two-state solution. I know this term is majorly used in the Israel-Palestinian context, but you know, back in 1947, when we accepted the partition, officially the Congress and India maintained that well, it was not on the religious grounds, but in essence, it was on the religious grounds. So do you think that if we had effected, or was it possible to effect the complete transfer of population and to implement the idea of two-state solution in letter and spirit? And if that had actually happened, let's say we would have formed some, some kind of a ministry of partition affairs you know, that, that worked for like 10 years, 15 years, and uh, it would have been tasked for exercising the complete transfer of population towards both the sides. If that, if that had happened, do you think that things would have been much better or not? You know, I think that's a hypothetical that historians will discuss. It's also a very political proposition. Um, you know, and it, it's not that it wasn't discussed. It was discussed before partition, uh, during partition, in the years after partition. But I think uh, in subsequent decades, it has been clear that uh, India and Pakistan had different trajectories, uh, different ideas of themselves. And India was a, a constitution-based uh, polity, which was accepting of all citizens, regardless of religion while uh, Pakistan uh, made itself a religion-based uh, uh, polity. And I don't think uh, there is any mainstream uh, questioning of this fundamental uh, trajectory uh, in India. There may be fringe, uh, fringes which, uh, which question it. And on, on its own also, if you go back as, and look at the historical hypothetical of could you have done a 100% perfect exchange of populations? I don't think so. Uh, and, you know, it certainly had to be an exchange of populations um, of, uh, of uh, allowing people willing to migrate. It couldn't have been, uh, you know, drawing people unwilling to migrate to migrate. That would have been uh, absolutely uh, wrong, uh, even by the, uh, by, by the judgments of those times. So I think, um, it is a hypothetical that historians uh, can uh, debate and discuss. It, it would become very political uh, if you discuss it in a contemporary context. But uh, if you see the writings of those times, uh, there was uh, a conversations around it and there were also conversations around hostage populations because the feeling was that there would be more stability if each country had some hostage uh, populations uh, of uh, uh, minorities, uh, which uh, which could be used to ensure mutual good behavior. So I I, I think uh, uh, I I wouldn't go beyond that. Uh, it's uh, to say that it is any serious uh, conversation in today's context. So thank you very much for your insightful remarks. Sometimes these counterfactuals are very important, you know, at least for the curious uh, students of history. So my next question now, so we always hear that uh, you know, that uh, these uh, extremist elements, uh, they're like fringe groups in Pakistan. But, you know, uh, once again, when Masood Azhar goes out for a big rally or a procession, you see thousands and lakhs of people come into his processions. When Hafiz Saeed makes a speech, you see thousands and lakhs of people coming in at, to attend his procession. When Salman Taseed's bodyguard, the, the fellow who killed him in that RCI BB case, you know, when his funeral procession was being uh, carried out in Karachi, you could see hundreds of people coming in drugs and he was being hailed as a Ghazi. So I want to know what is the status of these extremist leaders, so-called terrorists in the Pakistani society? Because frankly speaking, 
when I see these pictures, I feel that, I mean, we call them terrorists, but certainly in Pakistani societies, they are hailed as some kind of religious figures or spiritual masters. And with this, if this is the case, when the radicalization levels are in, pa in Pakistan, if they are going uh, at a very high pace and the society is moving towards more and more of extremist version of Islam, what is the future of Pakistan? You know, I think uh, that is an interesting question that Pakistan itself debates. And uh, what you raise are two separate issues. One is that how radical is Pakistan? How radical are the people of Pakistan? Certainly Pakistan's army rulers found some merit in co-opting what they thought was a, a religious radical element in Pakistan society and particularly Ziaul Haq in the 1980s. You know, you would recall that uh, the MMA used to be called the Mullah Military Alliance. So the, the army found it useful to co-opt what they felt were there was a mainstream of uh, of religious ideology and religious parties but the second problem uh, for, and you know this is really a, an issue internal to pakistan on how it deals uh, with uh, radicalism with islamic radicalism and uh, how it deals with uh, people within its fold uh, which hold radical views the uh, the different uh, you know, argument that you would hear even within Pakistan is that these radical parties don't seem to capture a lot of seats in elections. It's still the mainstream parties which are reasonably uh, uh, centrist, uh, which is uh, whether it's the uh, PPP or the PMLN or even the PTI, uh, which is uh, are reasonably centrist parties. They are not extremist radicals. But the other factor uh, from India's point of view is that uh, the radical Tanzims and radical militant armed organization have been weaponized and instrumentalized by the Pakistani state. So India sees no distinction between the jaish e Mohammed and the lashkar e taiba and uh, the Hezbollah Mujahideen and the Pakistani state and the ISI because these are instrumentalized uh, groups used uh, against neighbors, with even against uh, Western neighbors, for instance. So even someone like uh, the former PM Imran Khan said that there are more than 40, 50,000 armed people in our country, many of whom um, are created by the army. Because you, know, you cannot run a state without monopoly of force. And the Pakistan army is perhaps belatedly beginning to realize the, the problem of giving up that monopoly of force and creating these um, militant organizations for use against neighbors, uh, which uh, can turn against them. So I, I think this raises a, a very fundamental issue which Pakistan itself is debating uh, from the vantage of India and vantage of Pakistan's neighbors uh, we would just uh, not make a distinction between a militant organization uh, promoted within Pakistan and Pakistan's own uh, state structures. Thank you, Amos. So two or three more questions. That's it. So, what is the future of Pakistan's relationship with Taliban led Afghanistan? You know, it's one of the most troubled relationships right now um, because. Uh, when the Taliban came to power on 15th August 2021 in its latest avatar, Pakistan had hoped that they would do three things. That they would uh, forever keep India out to give Pakistan strategic depth. That they would uh, recognize the Durand line. And thirdly, they would uh, rein in the Tehrik e Taliban Pakistan, uh, which was attacking Pakistan so that uh, they, uh, that Pakistan does not face the kind of uh, challenges it does. But today, uh, Pakistan is treating uh, the, the Taliban and the TTP as its enemy number one, because all those three uh, propositions did not come true. Uh, you know, India is, uh, is uh, in uh, Taliban doing some kind of, is in Afghanistan with its coordinating mission. We are having uh, conversations with them. The Duran line is not recognized. 
and the TTP is the biggest security threat to Pakistan. So I think uh, going forward, uh, it is a relationship that could become even more troubled uh, because I don't see any meeting of minds on the way uh, Pakistan should be dealing with uh, with uh, Afghanistan and uh, you know particularly the recent issue of uh, Afghans uh, being expelled illegal uh, Afghans being expelled from Pakistan uh, makes the issue more challenging. Thank you, sir. Uh, generally, India is uh, accused or appreciated for doing the right road balancing between the West and Russia. But even in Pakistan's case, if you see, they are really good they're doing the good balancing between the Americans and the Chinese. How are they able to do that? You know, I think it's debatable whether it's good balancing. It's an attempted balancing. Yes. <laughs> and uh, what you have is a relationship of complete and total dependence on China for uh, for the kind of economic support that a collapsing economy needs so uh, so china which was a strategic uh, alliance has become a, a relationship of abject economic dependence and of military uh, dependence as well but at the same time pakistan needs a west uh, because uh, the imf loans are unlocked uh, by the uh, united states uh, and its relationship with the united states but it sees that as a very troubled uh, relationship because of multiple factors, uh, including the US-India relationship. So I, I think that Pakistan is uh, playing a difficult game uh, of uh, trying to balance uh, these two relationships. Um, and uh, from India's point of view, uh, it's not altogether a bad thing that uh, Pakistan has some equities in the West because uh, it is more uh, than more uh, under the scrutiny of Western institutions like the IMF, like the Financial Action Task Force uh, to modify its behavior. Thank you, sir. In your first chapter, I read about the interesting tales of our first High Commissioner, Mr. Shri Prakash, and uh, his very idealistic and interesting suggestions and solutions which he gave to uh, Mount Patton, which were related to Prime Minister Nehru, and then finally conveyed to Mr. Shri Prakash and his equations with the uh, with his deputies. The, coming to that, sir, I would really like to know that uh, this is a very general question. In the diplomatic service and diplomatic cadre, should we have lateral entrants who are not from this uh, cadre-based civil service background, experts from the outside? And if they join in, uh, what do you think, in your opinion, will they be able to make a good value addition uh, to this service or it's something which is not feasible and working? I think as, as a diplomatic service uh, evolves, it needs to be much more professional and much more uh, technically capable or because it's going to be a complex world. You need to deal with complex issues. You need specialization. You need capacities. So I think you would need both. You would need a professional cadre of diplomats who are specializing in different areas. Like, you know, we, we talked of terrorism. We, we can talk of human rights. We can talk of economic uh, issues and trade and so on. But at the same time, there are some very technical issues where uh, we would benefit from uh, outside expertise uh, because not all expertise could reside uh, within one institution. So I think uh, we need uh, a fair mix of uh, experts from outside and professionals created within uh, to deal uh, with this very complex world. And secondly, I think the way um, our interactions of the world are, foreign policy is, it needs to be an all of government approach. So, you know, all of government needs to be involved. And uh, even when uh, the diplomats of the Ministry of External Affairs or the Foreign Service are working, they need to work with their colleagues in different ministries where expertise lies in different issues, like whether it's water or climate or trade. And uh, we, we need to, uh, you know, put our heads together and, and deal with it while having a professional cadre whose uh, primary job it is to deal with the world. 
generally the, the experts who are hired as consultants in the ministry generally they complain that i mean it's like a two year assignment after which there is not much scope for progress and you know that these people don't get a chance to serve as the proper in a proper diplomatic postings like deputy high commissioner or like let's say dcm first secretary second secretary do you think that these people who are coming from out, outside they should get the mainstream diplomatic postings you know, I would argue that uh, people uh, coming from outside the system uh, would come with a certain strong technical value addition. And therefore, that technical expertise should be used. And, you know, the administrative matter of whether they you're using that expertise in headquarters or in missions abroad is uh, is a decision that we can uh, would, uh, you know, depend on the kind of expertise. So uh, I, I think there is no hard and fast answer there. Uh, you might, uh, there could be a certain station where you re require a certain expertise available, uh, for instance, in a trade mission of, from a trade specialist, and, and that could be tapped. But, uh, you know, the role of the Ministry of External Affairs and the role of this setup is to run foreign policy. It is not to run uh, a system uh, which uh, which gives opportunities of different kinds to people uh, because at the end of the day it will be uh, a choice which makes the execution of that uh, policy the most effective thank you very much sir one last question what do pakistanis feel about your book what do they say about your book what do they say about your book oh uh, well you know, I think my book sales were promoted a bit by uh, some conversation that took place in Pakistan. We, I had a very generous review of the book in the dawn. And I know for a fact that a large number of copies are available, whether they're by PDF or otherwise circulating within Pakistan. And I've uh, had conversations with many Pakistani friends on this issue. Uh, so I think the book is being read with some interest uh, because it's an account. It's certainly an Indian point of view. So it's it, it's uh, I won't say that it's completely balanced. It is an Indian point of view, but it also examines objectively uh, a lot of uh, a role played by a lot of uh, Pakistani leaders and and diplomats. And and I think that is the value that it adds for any serious uh, student of India-Pakistan relations. Thank you very much, sir. Once again, heartiest congratulations on this amazing book. And I must say, you know, I have not read the entire book, but I'm still reading it. It's a very insightful and a very objective account. And definitely the information, the anecdotes, even the factual part, that is something which is very insightful. And I guess all students of history, people who are interested in South Asian affairs, they must read this book. You know, this will add a lot of value, a lot of knowledge to their understanding of South Asian politics and particularly the India-Pakistan relationship. Thank you very much for joining us today. And also I would like to thank my colleagues and all the people who joined us as audience today. And so interestingly, I must tell you, we have Ambassador Jyoti Pandey sitting us with us here. He's joined us in audience. So would yeah. you like to say anything? That's wonderful. Yeah. Pandey, sir, are you there? I can see him here. Can you hear, hear me, sir? No worries, sir. Yes, but, I had the pleasure of dealing with Ambassador Pandey when uh, I was looking after uh, Russia and Central Asia on the Eurasia desk, and he was posted there. So uh, I've had many interesting conversations with him uh, through my career. Great, great. Thank you very much, sir. And definitely, I look forward to more very meaningful and engaging conversations with you and also inviting you to our offline events, perhaps in Udaipur or maybe in some other parts of this country as well as the other uh, the world. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I look forward to it. And, you know, that is the purpose of this book. If it can get younger scholars engaged in studying Pakistan, I think Pakistan is somewhat under uh, kind of analyzed in India. Uh, I think the book would have served its purpose. Sir, can I ask a question? Yeah, please, sir. Just, but we don't have much time. So he has to leave in like two or three minutes. So please, but please ask a question. I'm Rajesh from Indo-Asian News Service, New Delhi. 
Actually, I wanted to ask uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is uh, nowadays saying during different rallies that uh, unlike Congress, we gave a free hand to army to retaliate against enemies. He was uh, certainly referring to what happened in Pakistan, how our, our army retaliated there. So do you have worked with both the regimes, uh, I mean, uh, with uh, the regime led by Dr. Manmohan Singh and also with, with, with the regime led by uh, Mr. Modi. So what is your perspective on this, sir? You know, I, I make this point in my book and uh, on multiple other fora that uh, there has been a paradigm shift in the way India has dealt with uh, terrorism and particularly terrorism from Pakistan. And a case in point is the 2016 surgical strikes and the 2019 air strikes in Balakot, uh, which uh, changed the game and uh, set up a credible deterrence against terrorism and made the principle that, you know, India would be willing to go into hot pursuit of terrorists either punishing them punitively or uh, or preemptively and i think uh, that is what uh, marks a shift in that policy and i have argued that um, with the benefit of hindsight india had possibly not used enough force in the 80s 90s 2000s and certainly not in 2008 in the mumbai terror attack which deserved a very strong uh, hard power response and i have also argued that if India had used uh, instruments like airstrikes and uh, and uh, the surgical strikes in 2008, we could have set up a better deterrence against the terrorism that followed. So I, I would certainly uh, uh, endorse that view. And one more point, sir. And uh, uh, PM also said that we don't send doziers on terror. Aaj Bharat ghar mein ghuske marta hai. Matlab, we just uh, kill them in their uh, territory. So what do you have to say about this? You know, I, I've been making this point, and this is not a new point, that uh, uh, that 2016-19 uh, was a demonstration of the fact that uh, India was willing to enter into hot pursuit of terrorists in, in their territory. Uh, and uh, we, uh, you know, uh, the point I often make now is that even Pakistan accepts this principle. Because Pakistan was uh, doing strikes within Afghanistan and Iran and vice versa. So I think this is a well-established principle uh, now that it is uh, fair and uh, to be able to pursue uh, terrorists uh, who, uh, you know, cause a lot of destruction in your country across the borders uh, to places where they find safe sanctuary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abhinav. Thank you. It was great having this conversation. And uh, thanks to your team and hope to see you again. Thank you, Thank you so much, Thank sir, you. for joining. Thank you.